and I, and I worked there for a while. And then, then, then I went to Pepperdine University to get my master's in public policy. After that, then I came back and worked for the, um, the federal government for the Natural Resource Conservation Service. And I think that was probably the time that I decided to decide that all this stuff that's happening out here in, in, with federal programs basically sucks because we don't have access to a lot of the stuff that's, that's written into law because of our status, you know, our trust land status and some of the other things that um, seem to be barriers, you know. And so I went to ASU for a number, U of A for a number of years to finish my degree. It took me a lot longer than what I thought, but, you know, I got it done and I stayed with it. And I think that's kind of a testimony in itself. And so now I find myself working for the Nat Native American Agricultural Fund um, located in Fayette Fayetteville, Arkansas, but we're all now working from home remotely and that's going to be our office set up from now on so there'll be a, there's about 15 of us that we just work from different locations in the United States and so that's kind of my background so you know I'm an academic by by degree I guess they would call me that but I'm also a, a farmer I've been doing this since I've been a little boy you know my, my parents would drop my dad dropped me off out here when I was about 13 and every summer I'd be out here farming and learning how to do things uh, the traditional Hopi way. And so uh, I kind of grew up like that. And I used to hate coming out here because I had no television set. I only had one channel, you know. <laughs> and uh, I was just, you know, I was always complaining, you know, how bored I am. And one morning my grandfather woke me up at 530 and we went out and hoed weeds and fixed the fence all dang day. And I'll never say that again that, you know, I'm, I'm this is boring out here. <laughs> And so I kind of got acclimated. And so, you know, a lot of the work that I've done in my, in my dissertation work was look focused on conservation and, and how we should, you know, utilize these great practices that are 2,000, 10,000 years old that are still working. It's just that we don't get credit for them because the federal government and Western science wants us to try to validate everything we've done. And I think that's wrong. And so, a lot of my work is focusing on trying to bring back the cultural identity through conservation in agriculture because we need that. And so uh, for Hopi, we're really retired. There's no separation between our agricultural system and our ceremonial and sp spiritual beliefs. And so I'm pretty much I'll outline what I'm going to do here in this, uh, this uh, presentation and you'll get a glimpse of what I do out here as a farmer and some of the policies that I'm trying to develop to try to make it more accessible in the field of conservation and agriculture. And I'm talking not conventional agriculture, but I'm talking traditional agriculture, the real McCoy there. <laughs> and so we'll see how that goes. So let me, let me go ahead and share, share the slideshow with you here. Um, let me see, share and click on this little button right here, right there. Okay, and okay, can you guys see that? Yep, sure can. Is that good? Okay. Yep. I'm going to need someone to leave their mic on because when I ask a question, like I'm going to have someone say, yes, I can see that or, you know, or things like that. And I'll I'm going to go ahead and watch my watch the screen there and I look at all the little buttons and just feel free to chime in, you know, uh, whenever you want to. Okay, so the title of my presentation is called the continuity continuity of Hopi agriculture. I don't know if I spelled that right. <laughs> anyways, looks good. So anyways, um, I work for the Native American Agricultural Fund and basically we're a fund that started out of the Keep Siegel settlement, which was a basically a lawsuit against the federal government for discriminatory practice against American Indian uh, producers. And so right now our main goal is to support and promote Native American farmers and ranchers continued engagement in agriculture. And so we're doing that. And so some of the areas that we're funding uh, are business assistance for business assistance, agricultural education, technical support and advocacy services. And so these are broad as they are narrow. So there's a lot of, a lot of broadness in each one of these categories for tribes to tribes, nonprofit organizations, what they call CDFIs, which are loan institutions, you know, educational institutions to apply for our funding every year. So this is one of the main reasons that I want to do what I do is because it says here that indigenous people protect 80% of global biodiversity on a mere 25% of the planet's land 
with less than 5% of the world's population. You know, and if you think about that, that's so important. That global biodiversity is so important because without global biodiversity, we do not have sustainability. They go hand in hand. You know, a prime example of this is with that, that's that COVID. You know, some people are saying the biodiversity wasn't there, so the animals couldn't, you know, respond correctly, and it got hibernated. And next thing you know, it got out into the population, and here we are. You know, I'm broadcasting from home. <laughs> And so mm -hmm. that's, that's just the way it goes. And so, you know, I'm trying to keep that biodiversity alive. And so, you know, a lot of my stuff is, is not trying to protect people, but it's trying to educate people that when they develop new types of programs, they don't have to necessarily just brush the native population away like they have been for the last 200 years. And so we need to be part of that, those decision-making processes. And by getting my PhD, I'm able to become part of that decision-making body. So on to Hopi agriculture. So what makes agri Hopi agricultural steel resistant? So it says for over 2000 years, we have tested and adapted our agricultural techniques. Our knowledge of the environment enables us to overcome the many challenges of farming without the use of pesticides, herbicides, and man-made irrigation, which commonly used by today's conventional agricultural system. So out here at Hopi, you can look at the backdrop of, the, of that quote there and you can see how dry that is. And we don't irrigate. We've never irrigated our crops. And so we don't have a pipeline going through there, anything like that. It's just 2000 years of adapting to the environment we live in using a number of techniques that allows us to grow crops. And when I'm talking about the continuity over time, I'm just, if you look at those pictures on the left, those 1915 right across there's 2015, that's 100 years of photographs right there. So that shows that our system out here has not changed. We're still oh. using the same spacing, the same, the same seeds, the, the same everything, and it hasn't changed. Oh. So when I talk about indigenous footprint, you know, a lot of what we do is our, our belief system says that we came from the bottom of the Grand Canyon. But, you know, when you put it all together, it, we came from down south. You know, that's what our traditional story is. Tell us. We came from down south. And you can see the corn on the left is in Jalisco, Mexico, but the corn on the right is the stuff I grew about in 2015. And there's really no difference. So that, that's like our ancestral, ancestor DNA. You know, I don't need to send off for a kit to get that. I can just pull out my corn bin and there it is. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and so that in itself is a true testament of where we're from. It's like our DNA footprint. So who are we? You know, this is a, a, a petroglyph that was drawn up on up above below old Arabi. Uh Some people say it has different ages, but what it basically means is that this is a a true story of of how we are supposed to maintain our concept of who we are and how we're supposed to be sustainable. And so, if you look up at the the square, is the beginning of this world. That's that's the square on the left hand side or the right hand side of your screen is this world, this is the fourth world according to our traditions. And you can see there's two lines that go across. And you can see there's a bunch of people up there on the top holding hands and they're going up this, they're gonna go up this staircase and you can see that staircase just all of a sudden drops, right? And then you'll see the little guy at the bottom there, he'll be going through his corn, he's kind of bent over and he has his planting stick and his line goes all the way off the side of the rock there. That means that if he continues his traditions and what he was taught when he first came to this where we live at, that he, our traditions and our value and we will still be here for the next generation or for the next world. Now, the thing that makes this thing important is it's, it, it's not like the Bible where you have a heaven or a hell. That line that connects the two paths, that represents a way of going back down from the top up there from what I call the age of modernity all the way down to our traditional values. And so a lot of what I talk about and a lot of articles that I'm in, I always stress that point. You know, if we continue to practice what we've always practiced, we will be here and overcome a lot of these things that are being thrown at us on a daily and, and yearly basis. Mm -hmm. And so it's just a good story to tell on that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you want to look at some of my location environmental factors, you can just say semi-arid environment. You know, some of the highlights are six to 10 inches of annual rainfall a year. And I speckled that because, you know, at Cornell, they told me I needed 33 inches of annual rainfall a year. And I was sitting in my agronomy class smiling with a big, big, big uh, smile on my face. And I said, where'd you guys get your corn from? 
Because at Hopi, we can grow anything with that little. We only get six to ten. We don't need thirty-three inches a year. So I tell them, man, you got we got super corn at Hopi. You know, we we don't need that fancy stuff you buy at the store there. You know, it doesn't last that long. And so they were kind of taken back by me. And when I left there, they asked me if they could have some of my corn, and I said, Nah, you guys are just you would know what to do with it. (laughs) So you know, that's kind of an interesting story in itself. But, you know, so, but like I said, Hopi is, Hopi farming is our way of life, you know, it's, it's, we consider it our mother, the corn cob, our mother. And so we're able to take all of what we do and just put it in that, that beautiful, complicated and intricate package of what we believe in and just survive on that, just thrive on that. And so there's really no separation between our agricultural system and our spiritual beliefs, like I previously mentioned. Wow. So, you know, it can, and here's another example of that, you know, our season agricultural calendar, all those months up there with the word Muya, which is Hopi, and which is moon for Hopi, that's our whole cycle right there of agriculture. But it also is integrated with our ceremonial cycle too, because different ceremonies go on different times of the, of the year. That little guy right there, it has a mouse holding a little bow and arrow right there. That's Kiaomuya, and that's December. And what that's telling us is that that's the only time of the year where we're supposed to not do anything, you know, not play on the drums, not, you know, go outside at night. We're supposed to just be in there and tell stories. And that's how our traditions are enforced. They're enforced through stories. You know, they're not enforced through any academic criteria. They're enforced through stories. Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. that's going on from generation to generation. So Hopi is one of the few places I know where the corn is raised to fit the environment. Now this is important and the environment not manipulate it to fit the corn. And so when I look at that, I look at what's going on in the Midwest and as economically viable as that is, it doesn't fit the environment in the in the effects of that are contamination of the waterways, huge streaks of pollution that go all the way down to the Mississippi River and out into the Gulf out there. And it's just basically a big kill zone out there. Nothing could live there, nothing grows there. You know, people often get sick. And so that's that's totally unlike what, what you see right here. So a lot of our stuff is what they call place-based conservation. There's a little chart that just shows that, you know, everything we do is designed to fit our place. You know, all these principles apply to that. You know, it's a combination of traditional ecological knowledge you learn about, and it's a combination of indigenous agricultural knowledge. You know, there's, they're all combined in being place-based conservation knowledge. Indigenous agricultural knowledge is kind of a new term for me in the fact that I kind of helped invent it in the fact that it just focuses on food and all those techniques that go along with food. Mm -hmm. So the natural resource conservation's mission statement is this right here. And I've, and I've pretty much learned this well. It's the commitment to helping people help the land. However, from an indigenous perspective, the NRCS commitment of helping people help the land might be better understood for the purpose of a paper I wrote as letting the land help the people. Because if you really think about it, the land has supported us for thousands of years. It's helped us. And, if, and we, we don't need to help it that much. We need to get the hell off sometimes. Excuse me, we need to get off sometimes mm-hmm. so that it can rejuvenate itself. So in order for that to happen, we need to come up with these rules and policies that you know, produce stewardship and not ownership. So how do we define conservation? Well, Hopi farmers as well as most indigenous tribes look at conservation from the point of view of caring for a relative and not from a scientific point of view of conserving a natural resource. There is a big difference there, folks. There's a big difference because when you're caring for a relative, you have a whole different respect for it, a whole different nurturing ability with it. From a scientific point of view, it's just a commodity, you know, and we have enough problems with commodities in the world. And so that's how we look at conservation. So what makes growing crops in this semi-arid region, what makes this possible without any of the stuff that I talk about, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus, manure, or compost? How can I grow crops like this in the place that I'm from? You know, how is it possible? First of all, it depends upon how much winter snowfall we have. Secondly, it depends upon monsoon rains. Last year, for example, we had great winter snowfall, but we didn't have any monsoon rain. So none of our crops would, our our ears and our bean pods didn't fill out. And also, one of the most important things is our seeds. 
you know, it's the biodiversity that's in our seeds. And, you know, and I'm going to say something about that because I think, you know, a lot of these seed organizations out there, native seed organizations are good. They're, they're strong that they're preserving it, but they're not growing it out as much as they should be. You know, so they're kind of warehousing these seeds like they would like a jail with people because these seeds need to learn how to adapt to the environment. Otherwise, you're just creating another museum. And I probably get a lot of trouble for saying that, but that's how it is. You know, that's how I've seen it. So, you know, here's, here's one of the things that I had on a poster one time when it says we use existing vegetation as indicators of, of our soil moisture. And so these are our moisture probes. We don't have to spend hundred dollars to go out and buy a soil moisture probe. We just look at what's on the ground. <laughs> we look at the different types of plants that are out there and that tells us how far we need to space our plants and that tells us how far we need to, to, to be there to find moisture because they all have different root systems. And it's pretty an ingen ingenious way to look at that. So spacing and depth of placement, like I said, if you look at these corn rows, this is in Iowa, they're in clumps, they're spaced at least six feet apart, sometimes more depends upon the year. And there's a number of factors for that. And I'll talk about that as I go on. Another thing is our planting methods. You can see down below some of those little pictures down there, you know, after a while there, you know, those big clumps, when before they get to be that big, they're thinned out and we're using, we use the leftover stalks that we pull out of there to tack them around the plant to preserve soil moisture. Down below those big clumps after we harvest the ears are, play, are laid on the ground and they act as a mulch during the winter time. And they also act as wind protectors. So when the, so when the snow blows across the field, they act like snow drifts. And in the springtime, we plant in between those rows. Well, so when we plant in between those rows, when the seedlings start coming up, the winds also pass over them because it, 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 it just acts as a wind protector that also provides organic material to the area too. So it has a number of purposes, you know, you know, it's like regenerative agriculture, but what I've been getting in fight with regenerative people because you said you have so much bare soil in the ground, but that's not true. You know, all they see is a picture. They're not out here tilling to the soil like I do every day and see what, how much organic matter we have in there. And for us to put a, a mulch or a cover crop on a place like this, it would be devastating because it would suck all the moisture out of the soil, you know? But our holistic approach to environmental management using our system is off the charts. Another big thing is location of fields. You can see a monsoon storm coming in there. Um, it hits that mesa that's behind my field and it throws all that water into it. It ponds up down there. And that's good because, you know, ponding is, is, is just natural. We don't have any rain from April till the end of July. So that just sucks the, that's just all that moisture goes into the ground pretty fast. And, it, and all the plants can uh, benefit from that, especially the, the corn cobs and the bean, and the bean um, pods. So what makes the, what's the importance of our Hopi heirloom seeds? You know, look at the picture on the right for starters there. Look at the ground. Look how cracked that is. Look how cracked that is. But look at the plant. Unbelievable. You know, that in itself is a testimony to success, mm -hmm. you know. So all of our heirloom seeds are biodiverse, they're drought tolerant, they're what they call subsistence based, they go back to the community, there's no selling out here. They're nutritionally beneficial, and I just got an offer today by a lady from New Mexico University to actually take some of my harvest and check the nutritional value of it. And I'm going to do that because mm. I think that's important. You know, if they're also ceremonially important and culturally important. This is one of my pictures I love to show because when I was giving a presentation at the um, Biosphere 2 down in Tucson, um, they asked me to talk about drought tolerance and seeds. And so I brought these up there and I just wanted to show the difference between GMO seeds genetically modified organisms versus our Hopi seeds. And you can see the vitality. There's wow. really not much of a comparison. You know, same soil, you know, I water mine every two weeks. I water that one every three days because those little plants on the left-hand side just can't hang in without the water. <laughs> and so I just, you know, there's a big difference there. And they actually grow better without water than they do with, with water. And wow. so that's just something that's kind of amazing. So here's some of our simple place-based techniques. I kind of wanted to show you after that, after the drought, there's a picture on the left that has a bunch of, kind of like a single corn plant and there's a bunch of new, new uh, mud that's in there. Mm -hmm. That's just from one event. That's one monsoon event. That's how much new soil we got in our field after just one event. 
you know. So this stuff about throwing all kinds of, you know, soil supplements on my soil is a bunch of nonsense, at least in my location. I can't say that everywhere across the United States, but in our location, it doesn't make sense to do that because we are living with this environment. We're not manipulating it. We're living with it. We're living what it gives us. We're not taking advantage of it. So some of the challenges for our farmers, now these are the big ones. You know, I've had each one of these over the years, you know, I've had, these are just pictures of things like, you know, crows or, or you know, gophers or just too much wind or drought, you know, or, you know, all these things are just all over the place, you know, and um, it, it kind of gives us, it gives a sting to us, you know, but at the same time, it's allowed us to help build up ourselves psychologically because every year we don't expect to have a good crop. You know, that's just, that just won't happen, mm -hmm. you know? And so we kind of build that, um, what I would call that, that sorrow feeling that we have that like, you know, that like a lot of farmers in the Midwest, if they lose a whole crop, some of them commit suicide. You know, we don't do that out here because mm -hmm. we've been through all these situations so many times that uh, we've come, become used to it. And we've also adapted to that type of calamity. We always try to you know, plan enough to last us three to five years. That's so important. We have to plan enough to last us three to five years because we don't know if we're going to have a calamity or not, whether it be drought or some environmental disaster. And so uh, that's the way it is. You know, it's it's like it's like you said. You can't you can't uh, that old saying that was back in the '70s where you can't you can't piss off Mother Nature or something like mm -hmm. that. <laughs> I don't know if y'all remember that one, but that was that was a good one. Put some blade in a big mm -hmm. cloud. But anyway. And so, you know, over time, we've adapted our, our Hopi implements, you know, that's just a, what they call a soya. It's a wooden stick, a greasewood stick, and we've, you know, moved up to Iron Age. You know, nowadays, because we don't have as many people planting, uh, we have these modified one-row planters. They can plant at the depth that we need it to go, which is anywhere from 6 to 18 inches. We also have a cultivator. You know, I don't know if you know about the moldboard plow and its history, but it really devastated the Midwest in the in the in areas like South Dakota and North Dakota because it ripped the crap out of the of the soil. That's one of the reasons the natural resource conservation came into being because of all that soil loss. Now we just have a straight blade, which is the right hand corner. That's just a straight blade cultivator that acts like a hoe. It only takes off two inches of the topsoil and kills the weeds and, and doesn't disturb the soil moisture underneath. So it's a, it's a very beautiful, beautiful instrument. We're in the process right now of trying to get that instrument patented. And so we're, we're working on that. So what are the benefits? Why do I have to do this? What, am, what does this all have to do? Well, first of all, it helps reduce obesity on the reservations because of the nutritional material that's in it and the work that goes into that. You know, it reinforces family culture. It stabilizes families and communities. So no one is hungry unless you want to be hungry. I mean, you, I mean, I like to go to people's houses at like seven at nighttime to visit, say I'm visiting because I know they're always eating that late. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just show up, man. And like, that's all Mike's showing up. What does he want to, what does he want? And so, you know, I always, you know, the hopeful way is to have you sit down and eat first and then, you know, we go on our way. And so mm -hmm. that's how it's done. You know, they're very environmentally friendly. It increases the concept of sharing because without sharing, I could not harvest the field. I could not pull it off. There's nothing I could do about that, but you learn to share. And it also gives a real respect for the land because if you do not do that, you will not be able to grow anything. You know, so one of my things being a scientist, if that's what they call me nowadays, is I like to take the kids when they come visit me uh, in the summertime, usually uh, when all this is going on, they, sometimes the villages have these little youth projects. And I talk to them about this and I say, let's go look at the cornfield. And I say, what do you want to, you know, I said, did you guys know that you're learning to be an hydrologist and an agronomist and a botanist and, a, and a, an environmentalist? And, and they said, nah, what's that, Mike? What's that? And I kind of show them the basics of that. And then so when I leave, I said, I, I said what do you guys want to be? And some of those little kids raised, I want to be a hydrologist, Mike. I want to be a hydrologist. <laughs> <laughs> and so you start with the youth at that very young age, because when they get to be juniors or teen, te teen years, are you know teenagers they kind of lose themselves and they're out there running around trying to find themselves and uh it's really taught of the youth and it's it's been like that since uh since time immemorial you know i mean when a child for example is first born after two weeks old he's taken to the village and his his paternal aunt raises him and gives him his hopi name or her hopi name and puts a small little piece of sweet corn pudding in their mouth and raises them to the sun you know so they know that they're tied to that environment they're always going to be there 
So, you know, the beliefs and practices, this is my, one of my favorites, the beliefs and practices that define us as indigenous people is often called informal knowledge, you know, and so, but what it says is, I must ask what makes the so-called formal knowledge of scientists and academia more valuable. You mm -hmm. think about that. What makes their knowledge more valuable than what we have? Mm -hmm. Ours is based upon survival. Theirs is based upon what I would call glorification, mm -hmm. you know, and as being a scientist, don't take me wrong. You know, I'm not an anti-climatic person. I'm not an anti-climate, you know, climate change person. I believe, do believe climate is changing. But what I don't hear out there from my fellow scientists is, is telling people how to adapt to that climate change. Mm -hmm. They don't tell you how to adapt. They just say, what's changing is changing, you know? And it's, so what if it's changing? Have you learned how to adapt? No, they haven't learned how to adapt. And so they're just, everybody's just kind of running around trying to figure out what's going on. So, you know, I came up with this just the other week, just kind of a real quick one, you know, a scientific method over there. I'll just show a few of them, you know, ask a question, you know, you observe environmental conditions on the right, you know, construct a hypothesis, you know, you, you look at certain plants, you then ask a question, that's your hypothesis. You know, you communicate your results is my favorite one. You know, if you look down at the bottom, you know, you're sharing your harvest with your, with your, with your, with your, uh, with your relatives and you're raising your crops. So you're communicating your results. So in retrospect, we do everything the scientific method does, but yet that's, that's valid for them. And what we do is the same thing. It's just framed differently, but yet ours is called informal knowledge. It doesn't make any sense to me. Why is it like that? You know, and uh, our language is different. You know, our, our concept and our philosophies are different. And so we need to figure out ways in order to make it all work together. Mm -hmm. So bam, so what is indigenous knowledge, agricultural knowledge, applied knowledge for raising food and other agricultural products that is grounded in indigenous belief systems and practices which have been time tested over a millennia. Bam. So when I look at indigenous agricultural knowledge and I stack them up against what I call NRCS practice standards and I look at how they do that, you know, the rigor is time tested uh, versus the scientific method. You know, the panel of experts, our panel of experts are ritual, history, and stories. You know, the peer review process is, is what scientists use, and that's a, that's a great process, but it's time consuming, and it just, I mean, it beats the heck out of me because I had to do that to get my papers published. It takes me a year to get my paper published, almost two mm -hmm. years sometimes, and it's crazy. But look at the key thing. Look at the replicability. That's what science is based upon. 2,000 years of replication, folks, versus only 200 years for these Western pr proven practices. 2,000 years versus 200. So when somebody tells me that I need to prove something, I tell them to go jump in the lake. I say, thank you, sir. Then I say, go jump in the lake. But for the, <laughs> most, part, <laughs> for the most part, they've got to really listen to what we're talking about. So, so what I did was I wrote a paper that should be in the Journal of Water and Soil Conservation coming out here pretty soon. And I basically stacked up three tribes and I said, well, here's, here's our practices as a holistic standpoint of view. Here's the linear approach that NRCS uses, but look at the conservation outcomes. They're the same. They produce the same effect. But yet these ones are funded on the right. Those practices are funded and our practices aren't funded. Hmm. So example, contour farming. We've been doing contour farming since the get-go. NRCS just now calls it that. You know, I always tell them, you have a new vocabulary, but you do not have a new practice. You know, you just have a new vocabulary, but no new practice. It doesn't, and they, you know, they kind of shake their heads and look at me. That's good. So here's another one, crosswind traps. We did the same thing. It's just a, it's just a barrier in the middle of the fields to, to help with, with soil and water erosion. We've been doing that forever again. You know, and so what are the methods of this? You know, NRCS came up with this. What is the, what is the solution to some of this? So NRCS came up with what they call a, uh, an indigenous methods guidebook. They thought that if they put this guidebook out there that it would be a one solve all problem. We'll, able, we'll be able to incorporate indigenous knowledge into our methods. But it creates a bureaucracy again, another level on what the farmer, the traditional indigenous sustainable farmer wants to do naturally. It creates another bunch of hoops to go through. Yes. But, you know, the pros are that it, the pros are, like I said, it does recognize the problem. It educates employees. You know, it provides a mechanism to validate traditional practices. But that's about all it does. So, you know, some of the cons is, like I said, it creates a barrier. It puts the validation of our practices into the decision makers that are, that are Western controlled. And who knows mm -hmm. what's going to happen to that? 
Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's the inability by applicant to file traditional practices because of the technical access. And I've worked on the reservation and it's just not out here. It's not out here, you know, and also they're on a case by case basis. So if my farmer friend down the road, two miles away, uses the same practice, he'll have to do the same thing over again. So, and this, so this is what I'm proposing. You know, first of all, the, the, one of our biggest things is what they call the lack of capital. Most reservations don't have the capital in the area of natural resources or even have time to go in that direction because they're inundated with social problems mm -hmm. like education and, 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 and alcoholism and all that other stuff out there. But in the new farm bill, there's this thing called internal funding arrangements and it changed the language in there, went from may to shall enter into these internal funding mechanisms with tribes. But right now, as of the last I've heard, the state conservationists aren't out there talking about it because what this is going to do, it's going to give funding directly to the tribes. And it's going to recognize traditional tribal agricultural structures and systems, and it's going to move all the power structure away from NRCS to the tribes. It's almost going to be like a self-determination contract. We'll be able to fund, you know, scores of people to come out and plant. We'll be able to do all these things. Our technical service providers will be our elders. You know, it's going to do all this beautiful stuff. But right now, the district, the state conservationists are just shaking their head. You know, like, oh, man, what are we going to do? And so I'm pushing this thing. You know, and so, 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 so but some of the solutions to some of this limited recognition, this is what I'm proposing in, in this policy paper that's going to go out here after a while. This is what I call indigenous field office technical guides. And that's basically an NRCS technical guide, but it has our own values and our own practices in it. On a regional base or a tribal base, we have complete control over it. We're, we're able to determine what goes in and what doesn't go in. But all those practices in there will be funded. You know, there's gonna be tremendous collaborative efforts between NRCS and tribe and the BIA, of course, because the BIA is our, is our trustee. So, you know, we're going to have to go through this process, but it's, I think it can work, but we need to have pilot projects first. And so what are the objectives of this? First is to demonstrate that our practices are legitimized by their rigor and replicability. It treats our methods as NRC as standard practices. It circumvents the current procedure of adding IAK methods to that, what they call the field office technical guide. It streamlines the administrative process. And it also, the most important thing, it reinforces tribal identity and cultural values important to human well-being, because that's what a lot of us need. We need to feel safe and we need to remember who we are, because in my philosophical opinion, a lot of us forgot that. Mm -hmm. And so we need to refocus on that. So in my conclusion, you know, I just, you know, I just kind of want to say this, and, and I will say this because it's on the screen. To meet the pressing environmental challenges we face as a broader society, we must create new environmental solutions through the integration of Western-based science and indigenous agricultural knowledge whose very foundations are grounded in survival. And if you think about that, that's a pretty powerful statement. You know, our, our, our indigenous knowledge is grounded in survival. It's not grounded in commodities or making money, it's grounded in survival. And some may argue, yes, you need that to survive, in the, in the short term, you do, but in the long term, you don't. And so that's about it. And so I hope I said enough. <laughs> wow. It's fantastic, Michael. Really, really very interesting. Um, let's see. Can you unshare your screen? And that way we can maybe start some dialogue. Yeah, yeah. I mean, how do you, how do you unshare it? Oh, you I think you just clicked that. There the you go. Perfect. <laughs> Who, okay, um, sorry about that. I have a question. So, so yeah, so this is a, a pretty big deal. You know, you've, you've got this um, transfer process going on from, you know, what used to be NRCS and now they're going to transfer it to the tribes. In your opinion, what kind of, um, like you, you know, you're helping to reconnect children to the traditional Hopi way of agriculture. You know, you spend time with them out there and things like that. What, what programs need to be in place to ensure that other tribes are able to do the same thing so that when they get the funding, they're ready to run with it. Yeah, we need to, we need to, um, <laughs> my thing is that, you know, there's mechanisms out there. There's like, there's like 4-H, there's FFA, you know, there's, there's those type of youth programs that are in place. It's a matter of just taking those and uh, tweaking them to fit our culture. 
you know, and because those things are well sought after, they'll get the support. I know these organizations pretty well. They want to support things like this. Mm -hmm. So we need to use an existing mechanism and tweak it. And so that's how we'd be able to do that and answer that question for you. So are those programs in place yet or? No, or there's, there's, that's a, that's a thing about it. They, they are in some places, but they need to be more broader based. Okay. You know, that's why I'm, I'm pushing with the National Association of Conservation Districts and, you know, and some of the other non-Indian organizations out there to help the Indian organizations like the Indian National Conservation Alliance, the Indian Agricultural uh, Council, those type of organizations to jump on board because we need to push this, you know. Over at NAF, our, our, our organization, we're starting to talk to those people that lead these big organizations like the FFA and the, and the 4-H and get them on board mm -hmm. because this needs to happen. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I'm talking about things not necessarily traditional agriculture, but agriculture in general. Because right. when you look at the stats, like for Arizona, the Indian tribes are the last basically agriculturalists in the state. And that's, mm -hmm. that's conventional ranching and stuff like that. And so we need to we need to make sure that those people are well taken care of and the stuff they produce is being value added right there on the reservation instead of right. taking to some market and making money someplace else. Right. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah. Hi, Mike. Hi, this is Annette. Um, Hi, Annette. Is that in the farm bill? I did you already get that language put in the farm bill? Yeah, your... it's in the farm bill. It's in the 2018 farm uh -huh. bill. That it's AFA. It's under the conservation title. I, I believe it's Title II, and so it's in there. Um, a wow. lot of the, you know, there's this, there's this source called the um, Indigenous Agricultural. I think it's Indigenous Agricultural Foods Food Group or something mm -hmm. like that. Or if you actually, if you looked up the Native Farm Bill Coalition, you could see all the all the legislation that went into the farm bill. And so we weren't asking for money. We didn't ask for any money. What we asked for was just language changes. And so we got everything we wanted except for the thing that I really kind of wanted and that was to the intellectual property of seeds to preserve that. That was taken out. But we'll get that in there this time around. I guarantee it. <laughs> wow. Because we're trying well, to- that's good, good job. <laughs> yeah, we're just trying to control things, yeah. And so I'm, I'm, I'm excited about it. And so yeah. it's just a matter of tribes, you know, taking care of it. It's just like, in the farm bill, we're able, the tribes are able to administer their own SNAP programs. You know, they can do that if they want to, too. The problem with the tribes that I see at the level is that we need to catch everybody up to speed to educate them enough so that they could, they could bring it in. You know, um, we're still kind of too dependent upon the BIA and some of the org organizations to actually run things ourselves. And that's because of all these years of what I call parentalism. But, you know, we're slowly going to get off of that, I believe, so that we're able to run our own affairs again at some point. Um, yeah. You know, one of the best things that happened, I don't know if you heard today, but was that the half of Oklahoma is considered Indian country. And that's something. <laughs> and so that was kind of mm -hmm. neat because that was just saying that, you know, that your tribe, your reservations have never been um, diminished and the jurisdictional issues that you have over Indians there is still your jurisdiction. It yes. doesn't belong to the state. And so that's why it's so important. And so, you know... Um, if I had my chance, I would just take it, take it all back, but I can't do that. So I'm just one voice in the wilderness. <laughs> yeah, but if you're going to ask, right now is the time to ask SCOTUS. Apparently they're in a yeah, really good mood. Yeah, so, you, know, anyway. you know, that, that you know, off top topic, but Gorsuch, you know, he, even though he's a Trump nominee, a lot of people in Indian country knew this guy was big time versed on Indian law. That was his background. He had a lot of Indian cases on that. So there wasn't that much resistance from him, even, even though he was a Trump nominee, there wasn't that much resistance. Indian country has got a blessing from this guy, you know, yeah, interesting. until they're able to put like a Diane Humitua or some tribal person on there that knows well, you know, it's always going to be dependent upon one or two people that know Indian law yeah. and very few people don't. And yeah. so. Wow. Um, well, Renee said, great work. I'm glad you're spearheading new indigenous thoughts. So good job. And Renee's with Thank the you. BIA. She's very, um, active in our class. And so one of the things that, you know, one of the reasons that this class came about was because of that kind of default transfer that's happening um, in managing rangelands. You know, BIA is losing some of their budget for that particular area and it's yeah. getting harder and harder to recruit um, range specialists, you know, like it is all around the board. There just aren't many people going into it. And so by mm -hmm. default, the BIA is now partnering with the tribes to help transfer 
some of that um, that knowledge to manage those rangelands. And so that's why this class came about. But we're still in the process of adapting the class to topics specifically for like what you're talking about here, you know, that, that's culturally and traditionally appropriate um, and place based, not just what NRCS wants us to teach people or what, you know, we learn in westernized science at the universities. Yeah. We're trying to, you know, um, merge that as everybody kind of comes together into one lane. You know, as uh, what I see down the line, Diane, is what I see down the line is that, you know, as, as the tribes start to develop their own processing plants, you know, their own, you know, more cattle, mm -hmm. they're going to become, they're going to need to become more sustainable mm -hmm. and, and therefore they're going to need those people. More autonomous. But, yeah. Yeah. But you're going to need that. You're going to need those, those type of things to spring up first because yeah. right now it's, 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 or, you know, it's a lot of non-Indians, you know, majority yes. of them at least tribal land and so they're making the money and the, and the Indians aren't making anything harder yeah so there's a lot yep. of things that need to change in there and so you know we've talked about it before and so I'm sure we'll be talking about it again yeah so, but it is interesting you know now that we hear your talk and we're seeing what's going on with the farm bill the change is taking place it is I mean, taking it's, place. it's slow but it's like wow it's kind of like you know a slow tide here but it is changing it is changing and I think it's changing at the right time because I think you know I think we'll get a new president and I hate to be a political person about that, but I think we'll get a new political president and everything's going to shift mm -hmm. nine degrees back the other direction for the environment, for climate mm -hmm. change. Mm -hmm. It's going to shift again. And so we need to be prepared for that. So we need to start thinking about things right now because it's going to happen. Yeah, you know? exactly. Anybody else have any other comments or questions and tell us what you thought about Michael's presentation. You can write it in the chat box if you want to, too. I can yell at me. I don't. I don't mind. I'm easy. I'm easy person to yell at. <laughs> so I have a question. This is Melissa. Yes, Melissa. Um, do you think that it would be beneficial if, regarding the food program, uh, the the USDA, the Commodity Food Program, one of the ideas I talked with a local tribal member is. The concept of um, if we could pay tribal members to harvest in, in Nevada, pine nuts are a big deal, as you know, to harvest pine nuts and then have, so that would be a, a, a way for them to generate an income, but then also uh, work on the traditions of harvesting pine nuts. And then those pine nuts exclusively would go into the local food commodity program. So tribal members in the area can benefit in that way. Uh, what do you think about that idea? It's a good idea. You know, it's ec economics is always the factor when it comes to, to things like that. You know, how many people can get involved? How many people, what kind of pay will you pay these people to go out and harvest these pine nuts? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think you can do that, but the funding is going to have to come from someplace and it's going to have to be worth the effort to do that you know I, I think with the commodity thing you know just recently i got something in today where they've added they've added new new stuff to the commodity list and so you know i don't think we would have trouble putting stuff on there you know especially now that we're able to you know run our own snap programs you know we should be able to do that but you know you've got to have the you've got to have the market in the in the in the capital behind that in order for it to effectively happen because you know, even out here at Hopi, you know, I have to sometimes I'll, I'll, you know, pay a little bit of money to have kids come out, you know, and help me harvest and stuff like that because they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're just into that, you know, and so, you know, I just have to do that. And so, you know, we need to make it worth everybody's effort out there in order for that to truly happen. But it's a good idea. You know, I would support that 100%. Mm. Thanks. You're welcome. Yes, Man, you get comfortable me. outside there. <laughs> yes, yes, Nancy, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Nancy? Oh, yeah. Um, so I'm not sure if I'm going to ask this question correctly, but I'm going to give it a go. Go ahead. Um, kind of when you were talking about your funding programs, it sort of triggered in me something that um, we were talking about this week, um, which is that uh, so we think we're going to have a bunch of funding for building fences under... Mm -hmm economic recovery under COVID. Yep. And what we really want to do is we talk about um, tooth and reconciliation up here a lot because of the, there was a big, uh, you probably yep. know there's a big, yeah. Okay. So what we, what we really are trying to figure out is, um, and we're just 
sort of starting out on this so we don't have any we need to expand our partners and things like mm -hmm. that um but how do we make uh what sorts of questions should we be asking to make a project and training and funding that doesn't become something that has always been done but with a different label on it like so how do we i know and i see what you're doing is you're just trying to move incrementally right mm -hmm. because that's all we can do it's change it's a lot of change right mm -hmm. um uh but how do we um do something different when we don't know what it is exactly we're trying to do i guess is what i'm trying to say <laughs> I don't know, but you got to first know what you got to do first, right? You know, I mean, yeah. for us out here in, in Indian country, we're with NAF, we're starting to, you know, partner with these supply chain people, mm -hmm. you know, because they're the ones who hold the purse strings. They're the ones who hold the, you know, not only to the supply chain, but they also hold some of the purse strings to getting people reelected again. And so, you know, that's, yeah. that's how we're able to, that's how we're starting to move a lot of our, our, our stuff that we want to do up here, you know, but the idea, you know, a lot of the problems that we have down here as First Nations people is that, you know, we have these one or two year grants. And then what do you do after those one or two years? Yeah, you know, sustainability so, is a question. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. the big thing. And so we're, that's, that's where I was talking about. That's where we need to try to partner with these supply chain people. And we're doing this not necessarily like uh, paying these nonprofit, these supply chain people money. We're just using our, our, our foot now in, in the, in the in our money that we do have uh, as leverage, you know, to get to the table. You know, so my recommendation is, is if you find a way to get to the table, you'll be a lot more effective than not being there at all. Mm -hmm. Because if you're not there, someone's going to eat your food, right? And so you want to be there all the time. That's what I believe in. And so it's just a matter of getting <clears throat> up to the table. And that could be through partnering with a, uh, some organization that has been to the table or is at the table, you know, or for myself, I'm just, I got an education now, so and I'm getting pretty well known out there. So I'm getting invited, you know, and, um, and that's good to do too. You know, I, I get my, my, my pay, my, my room paid for sometimes and, you know, and things like that. Uh, but actually I pay for the organization pays for my, pays for my room, but you know, they, people offer me to come. And so that's, that's the important thing. And so that's my advice is just partner with more people and just, but you got to have your ideas solid, you know, and you got to look at all the kinks and all the pros and cons of something. I, some people call the feasibility study and stuff like that, but you kind of, kind of look at that, you know, and see where it comes out at. Um, Renee brings up a good point to, to segue into what Nancy asked. And um, two, I think it's important that, especially like with what's going on with COVID and everything is that you want to have enough, foresight to say okay where are we going with this you said michael what's what does this mean for us as a people um so i'll go ahead and read renee's comments and you'll see what i'm talking about she okay. says what do you all think about these food donations um that are happening on the res especially here at navajo and hopi there's a lot of donations but my question is is it worth it i noticed many indigenous or city slickers now going into farming and certain organizations are handing out seeds the then Indigenous University Extension employees want to contribute back for free. I think this should have to happen on a yearly basis. So it sounds to me like, Renee, you might want to say something different, chat, if I'm not heading in the right direction, um, that some of this is being done without a lot of forethought. Is that, is that? No, kind of, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Renee. Is that right, Renee? Or did I get that right or, is, or uh, am I picking up what you're putting down? You got it right. It's okay. just that um, I don't think food donation is worth it in trying to control disease because eventually people will still want to travel to town, especially people like me that live way out in the boonies and it, you get donation, but they're not healthy. You oh, get white rice, you get mm -hmm. white flour and you get water bottle. And I've been trying to stress to these organizations, get two gallon, 200 gallon, 500 gallon tanks, donate that, then we won't be littering with all these water bottles. You get one big one, we refill it, we use it, recycle the same system. And people are just, 
Um, I see that a lot in emergency incident like Hurricane Katrina or disaster incidents where people just contribute stuff like clothing and all of a sudden when you go there to the site it's like a big pile of unwanted clothes and I see that a lot and it's like is it worth it is it worth doing this and 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 I don't know it just seems like you know the extension people are now helping certain people are now helping and it's like you guys should have been doing that long time ago instead of things when it happens and I don't know if that makes sense it does no. I get it I, I mean just, I, I, what do you know I, I get it too Renee I, I think you know one of the problems that I and I and I totally agree with what you're saying right there you know but but the, but the need or the need is temporarily right there, right now. I mean, that's that's what people do. They 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 bring these little things up there and they drop them off. Now, the solution to that, you know, the solution to that, and I wish that people would be doing this, would be to open up our build infrastructure. You know, build infrastructure to house some of these things so that people have the time to go through them, see what they want and see what they don't want. And also to, you know, having like 60, you know, 60 tons of fruit go back or meat go back because there's no place to house it. You know, it's kind of like we should have our own food systems, our food banks on the mm -hmm. reservation, rather than all of a sudden we got a crisis. And so people become dependent upon that. Then once it's gone, it's, we can't, we're stuck again. You know, we're worse yeah. off than what we were. And so we need to figure out ways to like use this COVID funding effectively to have little community food banks, you know, and then we could tell them over time what kind of products we want. Mm -hmm. But right now we don't have that. Everybody's just, throwing stuff up here like Santa Claus. And, you know, sometimes Santa Claus is not a nice person. He brings you stuff to get you sick, right? And so, <laughs> and so we need to figure out ways to, to, to harness the kindness of people to utilize it for our, to use it, it for the beneficial of ourselves in the long run, you know, the long run. And so, but right now, you know, people need what they need, you know, and there's, it's, just, it's just like trying to find toilet paper when this first pandemic broke out. We need that, you know, and so, um, it's, have your own TP stash. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the dual-edged sword, I guess, is, is yeah. my reply to that. Well, I think this feeds right into what you were saying earlier, Michael, about adaptation. You know, this is, look, this is the world now. This is getting crazy out there. And the tribes have a, are actually in a really good position to become fairly independent and autonomous yep. by creating their own food banks and protecting themselves instead that's of right. relying on the crazy world that's going on outside. You know, I mean, it's... Look, man, I mean, even look what's happening here. I mean, it's, this is not a reliable <laughs> source. I mean, everybody's going crazy. So. Anyway. Yeah. The, the problem that I see with that, you know, is, is, is our, is our, is our tribal governments that thoughtful, you know, yeah. that's the problem. You know, I'm, I'm not a, I'm, I'll be honest with you. I'm not a big fan of tribal governments because we didn't create them, you know, and uh, a lot of them aren't used properly. And so, but for but they are what we have, and so mm -hmm. we have to utilize that in order to get what we need. And Maybe so, that's where uh, we come in teaching the kids yep, again is how, how to adapt, how it's to a new generation. You know. Yep, a new mm -hmm. generation, and so we need yeah. to figure out ways we could, you know, have our voices heard a little bit more clearly so that we can get mm -hmm. the things we need. Well, great comments, and um, yeah. I appreciate everybody for you know yeah, coming in, for and then me. we're gonna record this and post it on the class site and then okay. also on the Native American Rangelands website. Um, so, cause I know a lot of other people just don't have internet access at this time of day. So anyway, yep. but um, nobody, any other extra who chimed in over here? Oh, hi, Brian. How are you? I didn't even see you. My screen was minimized. Now there's another Hopi person right there, Brian. Who met you? And hey, uh, have you met, have you met him? I don't think so. Okay. Brian, where or do you live? Good, uh, good evening, everybody. Hey, Brian. Where do you live, Brian? Uh, I live in Munkopi, but I'm originally from the village of Masangnavi, which is in okay. Second Mesa. <clears throat> All right. Yeah, I live in Kukutsmovi. Uh, from the so, clan. Yeah, I live in Kukutsmovi, and I'm, I'm a Kyle clan, but I have a house across from the, from the Veteran Center. I don't know if you ever passed it by, but... I've been working on a house that overlooks my fields there for a long time now. And so it's, a, it's, it's all sandstone. It's a really cool place. It's beautiful. Is, is that the one that's off um, kind of like uh, right below that Mesa? Yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, wow. You own that place, huh? Yeah, you should come check it out. I've got roasting pits there, you know, corn roasting pits. And everybody, you, it, people, they always ask me to use them. I just say, bring your own bring your own wood and you could use it. You know, so I've got a pika meat pits and tiki, tiki, tiki stoves, which I don't make. But, I, you know, I have everything out there that you would ever need. Someone says I need to find a Hopi wife, and, but, uh, but I'm working on that. <laughs> It's so, you know, I'm really not working on that, but everybody teases me about that. They always say, you need to find a hope you wife. And I said, I already have, I already have a beautiful so, you know, it's, anyway. Well, good. Well, awesome. Brian, I'm glad you yeah, got there. I've always wondered. Well, stop by sometime, man. If you see my truck up there, I'm always there, so. Awesome. Okay. okay. Well, Great. Thank you so much, Michael. This has been a really nice opportunity. And I have to tell you that you're kicking off kind of one of our ideas is to start hosting a monthly webinar for the Native American Rangelands Partnership. And then um, we might have you back because this was just for the class, but eventually we'll open it up to all of our tribal partners. And uh, it was an experiment tonight because we're just on a Zoom meeting. I'm looking at actually, you know, buying into the webinar package so we can do an official webinar and then a little bit, um, you know, uh, easier yeah. to maneuver when you're presenting something like yeah, that. Yeah, let me know. Let I me will. Know. Oh yeah. Supper time okay. here at my house. I gotta All right. <laughs> well, thank your parents for <laughs> so letting us. Disagree. Yes. Go ahead. Um, I know I have a couple grazing official here on the Navajo reservation and they're trying to look for um, a portal and you can be the portal to start hosting kind of meetings for the tribe. And I've been asked to um, bring in Bill Edwards. He lives in Talani Lake and he works for Talani Lake Enterprise. And last year, this grazing official has been doing more cow health. And he wants to, he noticed when he does a tally count, he um, noticed there's more people having sheep and he wants to do sheep and shearing and taking care of a, um, sheep all the way to the market. And I think this would be a good time to also do some farming um, webinars. And I don't know if that is possible or it's covered under your funding or your program to, then I can reach out to all the grazing official, um, 110 of them on the Navajo Nation, and then have them um, check it out. And it could be a learning experience for them. Absolutely. No, I think, you know, it's not a matter of funding because I'm going to go ahead and you know, have the, the, um, the ability to do that. And um, you could even help host some of those classes if you want. You know, all of this stuff pertains to rangelands, all of this, whether it's farming or anything else, you know, it's all on rangelands. And, um, and so if we can become a venue to, to help reach out, that's great. So we'll visit about that later too. And I know that um, one of the, uh, I think the Iowa tribe, they want to actually start having monthly webinar meetings for their tribal council on natural resources. And I told them, well, I think we can help with that, you know, and just to try to put together a program that would help. We could do the, a special webinar for tribal councils, which would be really cool, you know, because how many tribal mm -hmm. councils need to know uh, some of these things or some of the decisions that they're making. So we're looking for, we're looking for those opportunities as well. So yeah, sounds great. That's what I love about this class is not only do we meet students, but we make all these great contacts and start networking with everybody. So yeah. Okay. All well, right, man, Michael. you guys have a great night, okay? Thank you so much, Michael. Say thank you to your parents, please. We right, appreciate right. their living room. So All right, guys. Thank all right. You. Good uh, night, bye -bye. everybody. Good night. Good night. All right. Good night. Bye -bye. Good night. Bye. Good night. bye.